Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Thanks for joining us today. I've got a guest with me. This is Robin Porter, Chief Analog Designer from Neve. It's great to have you here. Nice to be here. Yeah, Mitch. and we're uh, we're drooling. Well, I am anyway. <laughs> <laughs> over this this amazing console that's behind me. This is the 8424. Yes. And what what I find really interesting about this console is that uh, of course there is the Neve sound quality, and and that's that's the reason. But it really was designed with workflow in mind, mm -hmm. I think is the way to, to, to kind of put it. Can you tell us a little bit about where the idea for the console came from and, and how it came to this form? Yes, um, the, uh, the, the idea for the console was that we could see, we could see that um, there was another sort of tier of a market, if you like, which was below um, ATAR and below Genesis and came into the sort of the genres of um, not only recording artists that wanted to have a, a really little, a small studio or something at home mm -hmm. that could uh, budget for one of these types of consoles, but also uh, producers and artists as well. Um, so that, you know, there weren't, you know, engineering, you know, types, but uh, right. wanted uh, something that they could uh, use to um, uh, record and uh, mix through. Right, and it really was designed with what what Neve and you as a as a designer learned working on the 88R and mm -hmm. the Genesis mm -hmm. and what was needed as we moved into the DAW centric age of recording studios. Yeah, yeah. I mean, up until um, you know, through the, as po people probably know, the um, uh, as uh, we we moved through the 70s, so we had uh, behemoth consoles with. Uh, a large amount of channel strips with equalizers and stuff like that and uh, all of that stuff got used you know um, in the recording sessions into the mixing sessions and the same the same applied really as we we went into the 80s uh, and even and uh, other console manufacturers were battling it out and with these even larger consoles in these mm -hmm. even larger recording studios that sort of you still we still use the dynamics and you still use the EQs in those consoles but um, you've got to remember that an awful lot of people um, were using their own outboard EQs and things like that and the dynamics that they would bring into recording studios or the recording studios had it already on tap as, as outboard. Right. Okay. And so it sort of as outboard grew, you started to notice that when, as I say, when you're allowed into recording sessions and you just sit there quietly watching this, watching this going on, that you know not a lot of the cues were being used and not a lot of the dynamics were being used. They're all there and they can be reached for straight away, and that's a good thing, obviously, mm -hmm. because you've got some noise and you've got to gate it and you've got to do it quickly. You know that the, the, the recording sessions happening and the musicians are very comfortable and what they're making is really good, and you don't want them to do it to have to do it again. So you want to go straight to a, a gate, get rid of the noise, and carry on. Right. You, you could notice that, uh, that they they weren't being they weren't being used, and I just thought to myself, well, it's a, it's a bit of a waste, you know, of um, of, of all this resource here and then what they bought, you know, because as I said, they're very expensive uh, consoles. So doors started to really uh, come on, you know, um, in leaps and bounds, you know, and, uh, um, you know, whether it be, you know, Pro Tools or Cubase or whatever, mm -hmm. um, they, they, you know, they, they were starting to, as the computers got um, more powerful and able to run the applications, um, then, you know, um, then the, the doors started to take over. And that, that, that again, because the doors were being, they had EQs in them and they had dynamics and you could clean up, you know, you could clean up a recorded co a signal with it or you could use it for mixing. Again, you just sort of think to yourself, well, all these EQs and dynamics on these consoles, you know, do, do you actually really need them? So um, we, we sort of got to about, um, I think probably about 2000 and, I don't know, um, it must be about 2000 and, Eight or about two, no, a bit earlier than that, probably 2006 or something like that. We decided that we were going to uh, produce a, um, a mid market uh, console or um, um, analog console mm -hmm. uh, for recording studios. A big decision was taken uh, then um, to, in actual fact, uh, not include the um, EQ and dynamics on, a, any, on, a, on the channel strips at all. 
But what we would do, would, we weren't going to take them away completely. We were going to, what we were going to do is we were going to allow people to buy them so that if they wanted to, actually wanted some EQs or dynamics, um, they could actually purchase them with the console mm -hmm. or later on. So what that meant was that it, the budget of the console made it so that it was much more accessible to a lot more people because you know, it wasn't a huge amount of money to outlay because you weren't buying all the EQs and all the dynamics. We made a very conscious decision to keep uh, the microphone preamplifiers in the console because they, you need to get to those immediately, you know, it's, right. it's, it's, it's important to have those there like that. So um, we produced the Genesis console, which uh, allowed you to um, buy eight EQs at a time or eight dynamics at a time. And not, not only did we give um, the choice of uh, EQ and dynamics, but we gave two choices of EQ. You could have the classic Class A 1073 EQ, or you could have uh, the EQ that was used on the 88R. They're completely different. One's a three band Class A, well, everybody knows um, the 1073 the EQ. Grade. Or you could have the four band, uh, four band EQ, which is, uh, is on the 88R or you could have the dynamics and that became incredibly popular mm -hmm. immensely popular to to uh, to do that and that's what we introduced onto the genesis console so we could see because of what i was explaining where you know doors had taken over um, if you still wanted analog clear you could have a small amount of it and then this console here this console's this, this console's born if you like in full door mode you know um, right. Because by by the time this console came out, then an immense amount of people were mixing in the box and using the EQs and dynamics uh, as tools mm -hmm. from that point of view. Um, but the the thing that was missing, the thing that's missing with uh, in the box, of course, is uh, a load of faders, okay, and a tactile surface to be able to go to somewhere straight away, get it, get the sound you want and then carry on and that's what I was talking about you know we were talking about the workflow it's all very well you know getting good with a mouse mm -hmm. you know but uh, there's nothing like having that feel and balance and you know and something you know knobs and uh, as well right um, to be sort of with it but with the Genesis um, because it's born in full door mode we we again I felt that um, not only did we uh, could we actually offer a console without any um, EQ or dynamics in it at all. Mm -hmm. um, but you still need microphone preamplifiers and you still needed uh, faders and you still need auxes because you need to make cues, you need to make reverb returns and you still needed um, a little bit of EQ which is in here and you still needed a couple of decent mic pre's as well. Right. Um, but also the other thing we, we did, which was, was done in, in conjunction with this console, was that I took, again, the remote mic preamplifier concept that had come from Montserrat, mm -hmm. that had gone through um, 88R and, just, and, and thought this console would really benefit from that as well, from a, f as far as a recording console was concerned. Okay. So again, that's what we did. We developed uh, the OPX to do two jobs really, to get to, to work in concert with this uh, uh, little, um, little console, mm -hmm. but also that we could sell that as a separate standalone unit, which could be remotely controlled from a computer, doing all the things that I explained with the, the, the what we can do with the uh, remote mic pre preheats that we used on the ATAR. You know, they've right. got to be able to, we've got gain, phantom power, and all of that stuff is is controlled through uh, through the console and the console's app, you know, to the um, to the outside world. Again, locking out so nobody can mess with the, the levels and and all of that sort of stuff was was, right. was done then. So, right. and again, you could buy eight mic pre's because again, a lot of these people have got a big collection of their own favourite gear, whether or not LA2A compressors or it could be, you know, um, some 1073s that they bought 
um, you know, vintage 1073s they bought and they swear by them. Again, it's that predictability that I was talking to you about of knowing how something sounds and how it should be every time you you turn it, you know. So, right. And so you get these people that roam the earth with these um, big sort of um, flight cases full of gear, you know. Yep. And then, so what you can do is that all of that can be linked in to this console because of the inserts in it. You know, so you can use the mic pre's. Mm -hmm. You don't have to use the OPX's. You could use your own mic pre's and bring those in. Or, and then you've got the inserts where you can insert the gear that you, you want to use to um, either you know, make, make a recording chain or you use it for when you're um, mixing. Right. So, right, right. So it's really ideally set up to be the, the hub or the centerpiece of your studio. You've got mm. 24 channels. Each of the channels actually has two inputs, so you can yes. have your DAW connected and you can still have a line input but, for a yeah. preamp or a keyboard. You've got your yeah. Q, your aux sends. You've got four mono subgroups, which yeah. is unusual in a console like yeah. this. Yeah. You do have two 1073s built in. Yes. And there's yeah. also EQ on the master outs, the stereo e master e e outs as yeah. well. Yeah. And we have uh, uh, DAW control yeah. uh, here as well. Yeah. And uh, you can expand this. You can get the motorized fader yes. version of this yeah. and so yeah. on. There's yeah. inserts everywhere. Yeah. But I think one of the key things with a console like this, or with this, one of the key things with this console, I should say specifically, mm -hmm. is that you're using the classic vintage mix bus mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. with the more modern mm -hmm. input channels. Tell us a little about that. Uh, I rewind back to 19, sort of um, 78, when I came back from university and I went, to, went into the test department. Uh -huh. um, at that point, we were still making consoles that were voltage mixing consoles. Um, but they got pretty big, you know, the earlier consoles in 1972, you know, they were BCM 10, 16 fours, 8038s, they're, they're fairly small physically, they weren't, no, well, 8028s and 38s got a bit bigger, but they weren't huge consoles, you know, by the time we got to 8078s, they were big, they yeah. were big consoles, <laughs> i say. And one of the problems you get with um, big consoles, they're actually physically long, and, and so consequently, um, when you've got, when you're using uh, this system called voltage mixing, which was used up until the 8078, say 6878s, what you're doing is that you're feeding a, a, a line level through a resistor onto a bus, and then the level drops dramatically. It drops from minus eight, which is roughly eight, minus eight, minus six dBU feed on level. It goes, drops down to minus 40, hmm. um, and that, is basically a microphone signal level. So that's what a 1272 does. That's, it amplifies that, that minus 40 si signal from being minus 40 right back up to line level again. Okay. And the consequently, of course, what comes with that is noise. Right. Okay. You, you, don't, you don't get anything for free with, uh, with that sort of system, really. And the other thing you get with it is because it's such a low level that it's very susceptible uh, to hum fields and pickup. Okay, and because these things are, are um, massively long, then if you imagine that bus is an antenna. Right. Okay, and that's, that, that can pick up all sorts of stuff. It can pick up hum fields, it picks up radio frequencies and stuff like that. I mean, um, Neve went to a measurable degree of. Um, to try and stop it by um, developing their own extrusion that basically wraps the buses into an aluminium box. Mm. Okay, so it sort of screens, uh, screens it all. But I can remember in the test department that you would be testing a console and you go for the basic, the, the, the first things you do is you do your earth checks and then you do your DC checks and then you can power it on and then you start to load the modules in and then you start to do the routing. And then when you've done the, when you've done the routing, then you uh, set the levels and then it comes to test report. Okay, so test report is measuring all the frequency responses through the desk, measuring all the distortion, measuring for noise and everything sure. everything like that and, and it's when it comes to measuring for noise that's the grimmest part of it <laughs> because sometimes it you know you wouldn't make uh, the figures that were demanded in the test specification for noise for the consoles and it was because you know you get pickup 
um, off of the off of the virtual earth, so sort the of voltage uh, mixing buses because mm -hmm. they were they weren't balanced. They're unbalanced. Okay, so that's another problem that you've got, you know, with trying to keep the noise down as much as you possibly could, and by simply moving the console through. 20 degrees you could tune out <laughs> uh, you could tune out the noise and, and the noise can come from fluorescent lights as right. well you know it's all these radiations that uh, can affect the, surrounded by uh, it surrounded by it and so yeah. so voltage mixing is a bit it's a bit tricky mm -hmm. and as the consoles got bigger because if you can imagine um you know got the 8078 that's quite a big console but then you got some very very big consoles in the 80s like 96 channels from Neve mm. and even bigger ones from other um, other, other console manufacturers. Sure. That's just impossible uh, to control, you know, the noise uh, from that. But fortunately, um, sort of like technology had moved on, and the thought process of how to make mixing consoles had sort of changed a little, and so consequently. Um, the, the, the design after the um, 8078 was the 8108, Neve's first the IC base of uh, the Neve, cons uh, Neve consoles. And that, start, that adopted virtual earth mixing. And virtual earth mixing is, it's, or it's called, sometimes it's called current mixing. Mm -hmm. um, that's, um, that's sort of less, if you design it properly and you design the 0 volt, sy 0 volt system properly, that's less susceptible to what I was talking about, these hum fields and fluorescent light problems and things that you can get. Um, and also you so say you can make the consoles bigger, mm -hmm. you know, you can actually make them longer. Okay. But you, you still can get problems with it. So the, the other thing that that Neve did was that uh, they went to a virtual earth balanced bus system. Not only do you get the, the properties of virtual earth, but you get the properties of the balancing as well. And, the, and basically th what that means is that if you have a field that is being radiated at the console, then it will cut across the balanced lines and it will induce that noise into both and because one is out of phase with the other, they will get cancelled out. Sure. So that, that's called common mode rejection. And that, um, that's a, another benefit you get with balanced systems, like virtual earth yep. balanced systems. So consequently, these, these consoles could become huge and you wouldn't get any problem with uh, the mix buses um, mm -hmm. picking up um, and wouldn't have to turn the consoles physically through, you know, <laughs> you know to tune it. You know, it's right. not a good thing to do. No, so. no, right. Um, and you can't convince a studio owner to do that. You no. know, as far as they've designed their studio, <laughs> they've got their loudspeakers there and their console's got to be parallel to them and that's the end of it, you know. So when we were looking at um, this console here, um, and also on the BCM10 Mark II mm -hmm. as well, that's another, uh, another one of our products, um, I looked at that and I thought, well, I'd be really interested to go back to uh, voltage mixing because there's no doubt in my mind there's a different sound. There's a different sound between voltage mixing and, and virtual earth mixing. It's hard to describe, but uh, virtual earth mixing is, is sort of more, it's more clearer, it's more darker sound, but it's, it, it is more clearer. And, and that's where the 88, one of the reasons why the 88R has that very, very clear sound and very, very crystal clear, no, no attributes whatsoever, mm -hmm. because that's that was the philosophy that Rupert had, and I've carried that on ever since. Is that to try and make things that have got no sound to them really, and, that, and then it's up to the engineer or the producer to add that, sure. you know, when he wants to. But with vo voltage mixing, there is a, there's a, a sort of uh, it's hard to describe. It's like a wonderful analog hue. It's very weird. You know, it just puts a smile on your face. It's really very odd, and and, and you can understand why um, you know eight oh six eights, eight oh four eights, eight the eight oh two eights, BCM tens, and things like that. Um, why people love them so much is that you've got this imparting, this voltage mixing, mm -hmm. along with the the transformers that you know go with it as well. Right. What I did um, with these the, those two products is I, I I actually balanced them up. Okay, so. Uh, it still uses the transformers, so we use a um, we use a, still use the same microphone transformer that you would use in a twelve seventy two, but you 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 don't ground the the um, primary 
one side of the primary to naught volts, you use the high and low and you drive it from the channels through a, a balanced driver. Okay, and in the, in the case of the, of the BCM10, it's two class A amplifiers out of phase that drive the, uh, drive the mixed bus. Mm -hmm. In this one, it's more IC based, but it still uses the, the, the balanced voltage mixing with, uh, with a, a, a microphone transformer. Um, at the at the uh, at the mixed bus amplifier right. uh, to do that. Right. Again, uh, with this console, um, I wanted to have that that sort of sound that people really like, but also I needed to make sure that they they could have a more cleaner mm -hmm. sound. So the group buses they are um, virtual earth balanced virtual earth mixing, just like the ATA are same exactly the same. Sort of technology. Okay. You can choose flavors. Nice. You know, you can have either either one or the other. You know, right. So. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, it's an amazing console. Like I said, such a, a great centerpiece for a studio. I mean, all the little features you included. There's DI inputs and headphone jacks underneath the mm -hmm. the armrest, and mm -hmm. and uh, you do have two channels of 1073, which for most of us working in project studios, home studios, yeah. composers, yeah. songwriters, that's what we need is two channels of, of great preamps and yeah. you've got them built in here. Yeah, because yeah. I, I mean, that, that, it, that's all part of it. You, you know, your overdubbing is, is incredibly easy in them. Right. No longer do you have to um, wait and then count in and then punch in with the tape. Right, and and before you actually before you ha you had punching, of course, so you had a, you had to edit. Right, you, know, so it's, you don't the razor blade out. Yeah, yeah, the razor blade <laughs> out. You don't you don't have that um, sort of anymore. Yeah. So um, it's very easy for you to use the two microphone pre's to do a certain job, and then you build the track up. Or if you're actually doing a band, then you would use the ten seventy threes for the special things that you want to pick up and then mm -hmm. you could use the OPX, you know, remotely controlled from the console to um, pick up the... Uh, cover all the rest of it. Cover all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. Man, Robin, thanks so much for sitting down and, and kind of giving us a story behind this console because it's a, mm. it's a, such a full featured console, but it's a little different direction and I, I really think the important thing to take away from this is number one, that sound quality that you, you uh, mm. told us about, but also just the workflow aspect mm. of a console like this in combination with your DAW is such a tremendously powerful mm. system mm. for any level of studio. So mm. man, highly recommend checking this out. The uh, 8424 and the man who designed it right here. Okay. Robin, great to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks for nice. coming in today and, and sharing all that with us. Uh, it's, it's fa I, I need one. Okay. I, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and thank you for joining us as well. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Mm -hmm.